Hi, so welcome to this worship time with Winfrey. Of course, notice I said with Winfrey, not at Winfrey, because I'm the one who's here, you're there, but we are with each other. Love the ability we have through the technology. So whether you're a regular part of our Winfrey family or you've just kind of found us online, we would love to know that you've clicked in on us. So make a little comment. If this is Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, I'm always live and would be glad to answer any questions, respond to you, all that kind of thing. I want to encourage you to be sure and print off from your Friday email from me that here's what's happening. Lots of important information on here about things we're doing to help other people and some classes that are going on. And especially this coming Sunday, July 5th, we're going to have a get-together. Appropriately, physically spaced, safe, all of that kind of thing, outside at the church parking lot, Sunday night, July 5th, 6 o'clock to 7.30. We're going to have a cookout. We'll supply the food and all of that will be done in a very safe manner. There'll be some games. There'll be parking spaces sort of uh, spaced apart where your family can have a space. Please do bring a mask for those times when you're very close to people. And I hope that if you feel comfortable being in that setting that you'll come join us. It will be great to see a lot of you again. So one of the other things that we're doing during that time is we're calling it 101010. And that stands for 10 canned food items or a $10 donation and 10 minutes of prayer. And our partner this month has been Chesterfield County Food Bank, and we just want to do a little bit more to help them. And so if you would like to participate, you could bring 10 canned food items or a $10 donation. And when you bring that to the station here at the uh, cookout time, we'll have a handout for you to sort of give you a guided prayer experience for 10 minutes. And I hope that that will be something that you or your family will do. So along that line, thank you so much for how incredibly faithful and generous you have been in your giving. It's made a world of difference. And uh, I want us to just stop and give thanks to God and pray for folks for a minute. So Father, thank you for how incredibly good you are to us. And we do want to pray for people around the world, people across our country, in our state, here in our own community that are in real need. And you have blessed us so much. It's our honor to be able to help other people, bless them in the name of Jesus. So we'd ask that you would take our offerings, you would take our shared efforts together with organizations like the Chesterfield County Food Bank, and do all of that to help people know that they're not forgotten and they're not alone. That you always see us. You always love us and care about us. And all of this we ask in your name. Amen. Thanks. All right, Winfrey Church, we're going to do this fun song that we've done so many times at church. Tony's laying down the beat. So we want you guys to worship with us at home, okay? You can clap your hands. It's real simple. Nothing crazy, you know, just praising the Lord with all your instruments you got here. And we're going to worship him, okay? You're the reason I live, you're the reason I stay. 
the goodness of your grace each day. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and 31, 32. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to be one hope, when you were called one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We are called to be God's people showing by our lives his grace, one in heart and one in spirit, sign of hope for all the race. Let us show how he has changed us and remade us as his own. Let us share our life together as we shall around his throne. We are called to be God's servants working in his world today, taking his own task upon us all his sacred words obey. Let us rise then to his summons, dedicate to him our all, that we may be faithful servants, quick to answer now his call. We are called to be God's prophets, speaking for the truth and right, standing firm for godly justice, bringing evil into light. Let us seek the courage needed our high calling to fulfill, that we may know the blessing of the doing of God's will. Peace, bring it all to peace. Storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still, the rage in me to still every way. At your name, Jesus, Jesus, you may 
make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, we call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fail. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. That the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is alive forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome your name is alive that the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. So with the COVID crisis this year, one of the things that has happened is that there are things that don't happen, right? So one of the things that hasn't happened around here and isn't going to happen are some of the mission trips that we had planned. It was actually this week that we were supposed to have a group go to Appalachia and help some folks. Nope, not going to happen. Uh, later, uh, we were supposed to have a group that were going to go to Puerto Rico and help there. 
Nope, nobody flying to Puerto Rico. Uh, we had youth group that had impact. That was also canceled. And so for the people who are looking forward to going on those mission trips, of course, that's just a real bummer, isn't it? But I want us to look at a Bible verse that I hope will maybe counteract some of those kinds of feelings and actually not just for the people who are planning on going on a mission trip this summer, but for all of us. So this is out of John chapter 20, and it's at the very end, the resurrection of Jesus, starting in verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, he said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. That's what I want us to pay attention to right here. As the Father has sent me, I am am sending you. So the Christian life is a mission trip. Our whole Christian life is a mission trip. As we go through life with Jesus, we're on this lifelong mission trip. And it's not just a select few of us, it's all of us who are followers of Jesus. It's an inherent part of being a Christian. We're all missionaries. We're all called by God and sent to share his love with the world, to tell others about Jesus, to reflect God's light into this dark world, and to help other people discover their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So whatever it is that you do in life, whether you're a teacher, an accountant, a salesperson, if you're a student, if you stay at home with the kids, whatever it is that God has you doing, you're on a mission trip. And whatever age you are, if you're a little kid, if you're a teenager, if you're an adult, if you're a senior adult, if you're still on this earth living, kicking, breathing, God has a purpose for you here. And you're on a mission. So, one of the really fantastic things about going on a mission trip is there's new stuff, right? New experiences, new people, new places, and you get to learn to appreciate something about another culture that you find wonderful or beautiful or exciting. And so a number of my early mission trip experiences were in Mexico. And as a young single man, I was invited down to uh, come speak with some collegiates uh, there outside of Mexico City. And one of the things that I learned was how important personal relationships are in that culture. And so uh, when a person enters a room, uh, you know, there are a dozen people sitting around they go around and they greet each person individually, shake hands, hug, and uh, if there are young ladies there, they'll give you a little kiss on the cheek. Now, uh, I'll admit that as a young single guy, initially that that was kind of awkward for me, getting a little kiss on the cheek from the young ladies, but I got over that. Yeah, I got over that. So what I loved about that experience was how every person is valued. But if you go on a mission trip, you're probably also going to encounter some things that are outside of your comfort zone, some things that are hard for you to handle. So on this other mission trip that I was on in Mexico, our host made this great celebratory dinner for us, this roast pig thing and all this other kind of stuff. And then they said, we have this special drink we want to make for you. And so they took a glass and they filled it about half full with kind of lukewarm water. 
And then they went over and they dipped into where the meat was cooking and, and scooped up this scooper that was just pretty much pig fat. And they poured it in with the water and then they squeezed a little lime or lemon on top of that. And then they were so proud, here, this is great, try this. So I'll be honest, I don't eat a perfectly clean diet all the time, but I try to eat pretty healthily and, you know, honestly, drinking a big glass of warm water pig fat juice is really not on my list of stuff I do. But they presented it to me so proudly and it was just everything I could do to drink that and smile and nod. So honestly, most of the time on a mission trip, things like that are pretty rare. And when they happen, God will usually, you know, help you get through that. Not usually, he will help you get through that. But I, I do think that there is a challenge about being on the mission trip that God has us on here in this culture that is more significant. And you see, we belong to the culture of Jesus, but we have been placed in this culture here in America. And at some point, as we're called to this mission trip, this lifelong mission trip, we're going to find ourselves needing to be cross-cultural. And what I mean by that is that there will be some characteristic of this culture in which we live that doesn't line up with the values of being a follower of Jesus. Now, as we live here in America, um, the culture in which we're called to be on mission, this idea of being cross-cultural, frankly, is kind of hard for us to get our heads wrapped around. And I think for a couple of reasons. One is our culture and our country has some pretty deep roots in some biblical values. A lot of our American values have biblical connections. And so in one sense, sometimes it's kind of easy to live as a Christian and as an American. And even maybe more importantly, if you come from a family with a lot of religious background, or maybe if you grew up in the South where overt displays of religion are a little more prominent, in those situations, for some people, being a Christian and being an American, they, they just like really line up right next to each other. Good Christian, good American, just right there together. And as I said, because of our roots, sometimes in some places, in some situations, that's kind of true. But increasingly, and in some ways that are very important, that is not true. And as followers of Jesus, we need to not make the assumption that the general values of our culture are in line with the values of being a follower of Jesus with how God wants us to live our lives. And that can be hard for us to see because we've been in this culture so long that it's hard for us to understand that because we're so closely identified with this culture. We've just been here and good American person, good Christian person. And if it's hard for us to see and to divide between those values, honestly, it's even harder for us to be willing to be cross-cultural. We've been in the mainstream for so long, swimming with the stream, that then when those times comes up that we have to swim against the stream, well, that's pretty hard for us. In John chapter 17, Jesus was praying for us, that high priestly prayer chapter, and he's talking with the Heavenly Father about how we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And he specifically says, Father, uh, I don't pray that you would take them out of the world. We're here. We are his representatives, but we're not of the world, just like Jesus himself. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, we are his ambassadors. 
We're his representatives. We speak for him. We urge people to turn to Jesus. We're not called to be clones of the culture in which we live. We are called to be remade into the image of Christ likeness. So let me kind of recap just for a moment. Our life, our Christian life is a mission trip and God has placed you in this culture to be his representative, his hands, his feet, his presence. And although we live in this culture, there are points at which we will need to live in a cross-cultural manner. Our goal in life is different. Our values in life at points will be different. At times, our practices, what we do, will be different. And so today, I want to talk about one way in which you may find yourself counter-cultural. And it's this. So right now, our culture is incredibly divided. There are political divisions and lifestyle divisions and economic divisions. There are divisions over guns and climate change and immigration and racism and gender issues and economic quality and uh, college admissions. I, I mean, we can't even agree on whether or not to wear a mask when we go inside of a store. And so not only are we divided about all of these things, but most people have this incredible hair trigger that just goes off on all of these subjects. One statement, one image, one news headline, and people just go off like fireworks. Well, actually not even like fireworks, more like a bomb. And that, that instant red hot reaction has just become an accepted trait inside of our culture. And I actually just, between us, I kind of predict that over the coming months, between now and election in November, it's only going to get worse as we continue to deal with how we manage this COVID crisis and starting back to school and the ongoing fatigue and stress of that, it's only going to get worse. And unfortunately, Sometimes Christians and Christian label groups are right in the middle of this explosive mess. And we do need to do things that stand out, but in a positive way. We're not called to be countercultural in a judgmental way, by being obnoxious, by throwing up walls and barriers and responding rudely every time we come across someone that we don't agree with. So we are called to be on this mission trip, in this culture, to be God's presence. And so I want to talk about one of the most important things then that we could do to be counter-cultural. And that is this. If we're going to be God's presence, then we need to be present with other people. And we need to be present with them as individuals. Now, frankly, this is going to require you to act in a different way than our culture commonly acts right now. One of the reasons that people just explode all over each other is because they don't see people as individuals. They see them as a label. They hear a sentence, they hear a catchword, they hear a phrase, and they just instantly label you in some kind of way. So, you know, they hear you say something, you're a conservative. They, they uh, see what kind of shirt you're wearing, uh, you're, uh, uh, I said liberal, you're a conservative. You're, suddenly now you're a racist and there, there's something else about you. Oh, you're homophobic or, oh, you, well, you're a never Trumper and you, you're a, a climate change denier. And when we do that kind of thing, when we just instantly react to people with a label, well, what we've done is we no longer see the person's face. We don't see that anymore. All we just see is a label, right? 
And when we do that kind of thing, then it's just really easy to treat people rudely and uh, object to them and not care about them as a person. But when we look at Jesus, that's never the way that he reacted to another person. He didn't deal with labels. He dealt with individuals. So one day the disciples come back to Jesus and they find him at a well talking with a Samaritan woman. And they're like, what are you doing talking to a Samaritan woman? But Jesus didn't see a label on her. What he saw was a person who was desperately looking for real love in their life and needed to encounter God's love. And so he's approached by a Roman centurion and he's asked about a healing miracle. And Jesus doesn't see a label on him that says, military member of the occupying force in our country. Instead, he sees a man with incredible faith. And other people might see some people and label them as lepers. And Jesus says, no, bring them to me. And he touches them. And a religious leader, a high-ranking member of the Sanhedrin comes to see him at night. And Jesus doesn't see an enemy. He sees someone who's in need of a new birth, Nicodemus. And a woman is thrown down in front of him. And he doesn't see a target for stones. He sees instead a woman who is being used and manipulated and in need of protection and in need of God's grace. Jesus didn't deal in labels. He saw people as individuals. And we need to realize that every person that we encounter is just that. They are an individual person. They're not a label. They're not an object. They're not a symbol of a movement or an ideology. They're a person who is created by God, who is filled with inherent worth, someone for whom Jesus died, someone that God loves just as much as he loves me. And if we're going to be God's presence in the world, then we have to find that way to be present with individual people. Now, that's not very easy, is it? So let me offer you just a couple of suggestions, maybe about some things that will help you to do that. I think the first one is, it always starts at our heart level. We can't go past where our heart is. And so the beginning stage of this is, you just have to spend some time in prayer and really get your heart right with God about this whole issue. The second thing I'd suggest to do is to be careful about what you let in your ears and your eyes and into your head and recognize that there are a lot of voices out there that have no interest in this biblical value that we're talking about. They are quite happy to continue to fuel the fire of outrage because it meets their own personal agenda and desires. And there are some people that it's not necessarily a conscious choice on some uh, malicious personal reason. It's just that that's how they've fallen into reacting and that's how everybody else reacts. And so they just don't know what else to do. So on a very practical level, you may just need to back off of some media. You may need to back off of that social media and the phone. It may be the news. And, and I'm not saying become uninformed, but every single one of us kind of has a limit. And when we get more than that, we start to get sw just swamped by all that and it will overwhelm us. And so I know some folks who have actually told me, you know, I've just had to back off, turn the device off, uh, get off of this particular platform. And they've actually found things are better. And you may discover that too. And as you engage with individuals, this would be the third thing. Let me encourage you to listen to them. Really listen to them. Be more focused on hearing them than on standing up for your position. Even to the level of be more focused on understanding them than on trying to persuade them. 
That's never going to happen until you really understand them. And just simply listening to people is one of the most valuable, important things that you can do. You instantly begin to communicate to that person that I don't treat you as a label. I'm, I'm affirming you as a person of worth. And you allow them to drop their labels and walls because you're not acting like they thought you were going to act because they've labeled you too. And you aren't responding in that typical explosive kind of manner. And then this would be a fourth thing. A part of that listening is asking questions. And so ask open-ended questions of them. Don't ask these boxed-in accusatory kinds of questions. Ask why questions. That helps you get deeper at the root. I mean, say to them, well, obviously you think that is important. Can you tell me more about why it's so important? And as you listen, and as you talk, let me encourage you to deal in stories, not in statements. Statements tend to build barriers and stories tend to build bridges. In our EHS class, uh, we're, we're taught that when we find ourselves in these encounters where we can just kind of feel our blood pressure rising, that we ask ourselves a couple of questions. And they're built around the two little words, I wonder. I wonder what it is in this person's past that has made them feel like this or respond like this. And then turn the mirror and look at ourselves and say, I, I wonder what it is in my own past that makes my blood pressure start rising up, that makes me respond like this. And then if I could... Let me suggest one other I wonder question, and that would be simply to think, I wonder what it is that Jesus would want me to do in response to this person. So in closing, I want to go back to that initial thought that we are on this lifelong mission trip. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had this incredible vision and encounter with the holy God. And God says, who shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah's response is, here I am. Send me. Let me urge you to make that your response also. That God says, I'm placing you in this culture. I need people who will be my presence. And your response is, Lord, here I am. Send me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that somebody somewhere reached out to us and demonstrated to us your love and your presence. And Father, now we understand that you've sent us out too. And we are to be Jesus' representative. We're to be his presence in the world. And so we want to, at times when it's necessary, not live like the culture around us, but we're willing to be different. So help us to not be so hair-triggered, not so explosive, not so just instantly reactive in negative kinds of ways. Instead, help us find ways to build a bridge that the good news of Jesus Christ can go across. And all of this we ask in your name. Amen. Thanks. Let's sing together.
As our time of worship has come to a close this morning, let me just say what a delight it has been to have all of you with us, whether by iPhone or iPad or laptop or television. It has truly been a blessing to have you worship with us this morning. And as our time of worship does come to a close at this moment, may we all leave together in the words of this benediction. May we go forth into the world in peace. May we be of good courage. May we hold fast to that which is good. May we render to no one evil for evil. May we strengthen the faint-hearted. May we support the weak. May we help the afflicted. And may we honor everyone. Let us now go in peace. Amen.